there's a couple of different um, studies that we presented here. Um, and I'll probably speak a little bit more to our longitudinal study that followed patients who were hospitalized with COVID-19. We have a separate study on patients who were not hospitalized as well that I can speak to um, in a secondary fashion. Um, but the first cohort we followed was um, hospitalized during the first wave in New York City in March. And so this is alpha or beta variant or the original variant of, of COVID. And uh, we followed those patients at six and 12 months after uh, their hospitalization. And uh, we looked at some of their uh, functional outcomes with quantitative measures like the modified Rankin scale, Barthel index uh, of activities of daily living, and then we looked at patient-reported outcomes for quality of life, so the NIH NeuroQual, anxiety, depression, fatigue, and sleep. And um, our cohort was split into patients who had um, been identified prospectively as having a neurological disorder uh, that was new in this context of being hospitalized for COVID. And then we had a control group of patients who were also hospitalized for COVID but did not develop a new neurological complication. And um, so what we found at six months was that the patients that had a neurological issue did worse, not unexpected. Their modified Rankin scores were worse. Um, they had uh, worse activities of daily living and so on. Um, but at 12 months, those patients um, who had neuro issues were actually not statistically different than the patients that did not have a neuro complication. And unfortunately, still 90% of patients had ab at least abnormal testing on at least one of the quantitative metrics that we looked at. 50% had abnormal cognition. And what's interesting is that 20% um, of patients, for example, complained of brain fog or felt that they were not thinking clearly, but 50% tested abnormal on telephone mocha. So there's a disconnect between symptoms and signs. Um, it also means that some people are not aware that they have cognitive issues, potentially. Um, so the, spe the magnitude of the abnormalities was higher than what we would have hoped or expected. That being said, uh, cognitive scores did improve between six and 12 months. So people were starting to get better, which is encouraging, um, despite the fact that a substantial proportion, almost 90%, still had some abnormalities on testing. Um, you have to keep in mind that these were really sick patients, though. These were hospitalized patients during the first wave um, where, you know, 22% of them were intubated. So that's a, that's a substantial proportion. Um, and so I guess it's not necessarily generalizable to most of the population who may have had asymptomatic or milder versions of COVID, where, um, you know, when we look at rates of post-acute sequelae, um, even within a hospitalized per population, it's definitely predicted by your severity of illness. So people who are intubated for COVID have a much higher likelihood of developing or having post-acute symptoms or signs than those who were not intubated. So there is a, a relationship there. Um, so, um, you know, and based on the literature, it appears that people who are not intubated uh, or not even hospitalized um, have lower rates of post-acute sequelae than those who were hospitalized. Um, there's mixed. Some people say, okay, no, you know, if you look at the population in general, the vast majority of people weren't hospitalized. Therefore, the vast majority of people with post-acute sequelae were the unhospitalized group. But if you look at risk factors amongst the entire population, the more severe the COVID is, the more likely you are to have post-acute sequelae.